So uh, I'd like to invite to the stage Mr. Michael Wright from Striata, uh, who built the company from his garage uh, and then went global. So I think it's really important we all listen up, take note, because uh, it's a really detailed view. Uh, it's very educational, and I think we'll learn a lot from it. So uh, please give it up for Mr. Michael Wright. Morning, everybody. Uh, I was wondering whether I was going to get the early risers or the guys who haven't quite got to sleep yet. So having a look, I think I've probably got a mixture of both. Okay. Um, I have a couple slides behind me which I'll talk to, but please make some notes because I actually thought the biggest value of to doing this this morning was going to be to take some questions. You've each got something that you've got as a burning question that you came to, to this event to have answered. You have your ideas, you've got you know, an idea of where you're going to go and what's going to happen, and, and you've probably got a couple of questions of how to get there. Now, I don't tell you that I have all the answers. I don't have the silver bullets for anything. What I can tell you is the decisions we made. And what I put up there is a, it's a journey of cliches, and a lot of people will tell you that cliche is used because it's applicable in the same situation over and over again. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the cliche, cliches that we've been through and we've used, and then a little bit about some of the choices and decisions that we made along the way. And I put up a disclaimer at the bottom there, please don't try this at home. But obviously that's wrong because that's where I started. So I started this business in a garage, my own garage. Luckily it had already been converted into a flat. So it had a, a little desk and you know, curtains and things. It wasn't actually a, a garage. But the one thing it didn't have was insulation. So at about 12 o'clock during the day, we had to go outside and sit under the tree because we couldn't be in the garage anymore because the metal roof got so hot that we couldn't actually be in the, the, the office. But we moved out of there pretty quickly, and I'll tell you how that went. Okay. So who are we? Just the, the real quick ones so that you can see. We do e-billing and e-marketing. That's us. But if you want a slightly longer version, all right, um, we replace the paper documents or any kind of paper that you receive at home, we replace with an electronic version. Secure document delivery, we do the encryption of those documents and we deliver that document via email with, confidential, with confidentiality, with the, the process being secure. And we know that we can replace paper with an electronic version. And of course, you've got the much longer boilerplate versions. If you had to sit in front of somebody and say, what do we do? That's the boilerplate. Okay. Um, but this is the 14-year version. Okay, so we started in 99, and we now have a suite of software that deals with every part of document generation all the way to delivery and auditability and knowing that the document actually arrived at the customer, and then feedback loops through that process as well. So I asked my tech team to give me a, a kind of graphical representation of what our process are or processes are, and this is what they came up with. Every one of those are modules within the, the solution that we deliver, and it enables us to say, yeah, it's email, but it's a lot more. All right. I've been in a couple of meetings where we've sat across from some seriously good techies, and they've said, but are you just taking a document, encrypting it, and delivering it by email? I said, yes. I said, but, but anybody can do that. I said, yes. In fact, if you take all the ideas out there and you break it down into the simplest parts, anybody can do those. And I guess that's the, the critical part about any business, is that at some point, someone's going to take what you do and replicate it and not have all the baggage that you've got behind it. So unless you build up the value that you can, uh, propositions that you need to in your business and make those individual value propositions join together to a point that they provide value to the customer apart from just breaking it down and doing individual, all right? You don't really have a USB. In our world, we compete against people who've done websites. You know, you go to, how many of you have got a, a, um, a bill that you go to a website and you log in and you take, you, you view that bill on a website, okay? It'll be anybody who's getting bills at this stage, all right? But if you think about doing that for 10 billers, now it starts becoming a bit of a pain. All right. What if you actually had all of those 10 billers consolidate those bills into one place? Great, then I can go to one place. But now if you've got multiple people wanting to be that one place, how does that work? Well, in truth, the place that you want everything consolidated is your inbox. 
Right? People use their inboxes for everything. Right? So the first thing I go to when I get up in the morning, I look at my inbox to see if there's anything I have to deal with straight away. The inbox is the perfect place to do this, and that's our business. All right. So where did we start, and what did we do? I went back into the Wayback Engine last night, and I looked at our very first website, and I have to say that I was so embarrassed I couldn't put it up. No, seriously, it was terrible. But that was back in 99 when websites, you know, were just starting out. So I took one from a year later, which looked slightly better, and you'll see that actually we weren't Striata at that stage at all. And this is kind of one of the first things I wanted to tell you, is that careful about spending too much or too little time on your brand, your name, who you are. All right, we started out, we were, we were all about email, so we called ourselves the Email Corporation, and it suited us fantastically for the first couple of years because people said, well, what do you do? I said, well, we're the Email Corporation, we do email. Okay, I understand that, great. All right. But then we started doing e-billing, e-marketing, SMS, multimedia, we're doing all sorts of other things that weren't quite email, and suddenly the name boxed us where we didn't want to be. So we had to find a new brand. And if you're all starting out a new business, one of the hardest things that you will do in your business is find a URL that you can use that's not taken by somebody else. All right, so these days you can trade URLs and you can buy them, but having a four, five, six letter URL that doesn't have connotations and bad connotations in different countries or different languages, it actually becomes incredibly difficult. And we spent three months looking for a URL and name that we could actually change from the email corporation into. And it was difficult. At one stage, we were going to be called Red Jump Moon, because redjumpmoon.com.co.uk.everything was available. And we couldn't find any word that didn't have some kind of connotation or wasn't already bought in one of those different places. Until we went to have a, a walkthrough, or one of my, my staff was walking through the botanical gardens, writing down names of weird plants. All right, and hit on a couple of them, came back to the office, and checked out which were available in the different URLs, and found Striata that was available across every different domain service we were looking at, all right, and had a couple nice connotations. So one of the things about Striata is that it's the formation of a five-fingered leaf. Okay, now marijuana is seven, so don't think about that, okay? Five-fingered leaf, and a five-fingered leaf the, the striata type of leaf, and it's, it's kind of an urban legend, but you can go and do a little bit of research on it, is that if you take the path that the vein of the leaf follows, okay, in this actual leaf, you couldn't split that vein in a better place mathematically to get a shortest distance to every tip. So nature has worked out how to be incredibly efficient in delivering the nutrients to the tip and back again through these veins. And we use that to say that's us, that's communication. We work out the best possible way to communicate with your customers and take paper and make it electronic. So a nice little urban kind of myth and, and, and legend that goes with the name. So we were email corporation, and now we're Striata. Okay. Another thing just to talk about in terms of how you, ev you know, evolve and your brand evolves is that this is probably, probably the seventh or eighth iteration of our website, and we're busy with the next one already. Right. Technology changes, processes change, and underlying kind of content management systems change, get better, make it easier. Right. Don't be wedded to just one thing. You know, build it, but be ready to throw it away. Right. Once something better comes along, if you've got the, the, the time or the, the um, resources, be, you know, be flexible enough to go and use the next thing as well. So I think we've used you know, four or five different content management systems. This one at the base, back end of this is now Joomla, and the next one is going to be in WordPress. All right. We're looking at Google Docs, we're looking at Google Apps. WordPress has got a great integrator, so we're thinking that we're going to use that for the next website because everything will be then linked up. All right. So don't be wedded to just one technology. Things are changing. Okay. So I thought in terms of what about starting a business is one of the most important things that everyone's going to want to know. And this is what I... I came up with, bootstrap or jockstrap. And the reason I put jockstrap up there is that when you get into bed with a VC, they have you by the short and curlies, okay? You've got to be really, really focused on what you want out of that relationship before you get into bed. Right. I've, been, I've been through two, um, both of them reasonable experiences. 
I had one near miss, and in, in hindsight, it was the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, we spent six months getting, putting together a term sheet, putting together the heads, getting everything together. I had the, the CFO of the business fly up, come and sit across the boardroom table. We were signing on the Friday, and it all fell apart. All right. um, it was like losing a child. It was, we'd put so much effort into making this happen. The upside was going to be like this. All right. There was risk associated, and it all fell apart. And what I, all I can say from that is that, you know, thank goodness it did because we are today in a much better position than if we'd actually done that deal. So don't be too quick and don't be too slow to jump into bed. I'm an accountant, you know, so I, I try and not let that hinder me being an entrepreneur, but unfortunately your training will always come through in some way. So I'm typically a little bit risk averse. Don't, don't do things too quickly without thinking about it time and time again. So, when we do the kind of funding processes and um, business cash needs, et cetera, we're very conservative. When you're in bed with a VC, they don't want you to be conservative. They want you to spend big and, and grow hugely because it's a portfolio game. It's about 10 guys, one of them's gonna be great, you know, two of them will be reasonable, and the rest are just gonna cull along the way. So if you're just growing a business steadily, they aren't that keen, all right? For us as a business, growing steadily is good. You know, if you, took, if you just take the multiple of growing at 25 or 30% every year, and that is an incredibly tough marching order, but if you can do that, your business will be huge a couple of years' time. Just work it out. You know, start with 100 and just do the maths. It, it just really extrapolates incredibly fast. So if you focus on just steady growth every year, the business will grow, the business will get better. If you take a thousand businesses, there will be one or two that have that runaway growth that go from zero to you know, 2,000 people in two years. But managing that is incredibly difficult. And there are so many case studies of people that fall off that bandwagon along the way. And, you know, it's very difficult to actually manage that growth. As an organization, we've always looked at it about steady, manageable growth. Yes, we've gone into acquisitions as well, bought little businesses that made sense along the way. But in most cases, what we really wanted to do is we wanted to buy the people. We weren't that interested in the, the revenues that they had associated with their business. We wanted the people to come in because you'll find that as you're growing, it's about the people that you really get involved with and, and that is the, the key to making that business grow further. So when you're thinking about bootstrap or jockstrap, understand exactly what you want to do with that money. Very important. You've got to have a knowledge of what you're going to do. If you just take an investment because you've got a great idea and you looks like you're going places and you don't know what to do with that money, it'll burn a hole in your pocket. And then what will happen is that people will say, you have to actually spend this, do something. And you start throwing money against the wall, you know, at marketing efforts, things that may or may not work. But actually, what does it do for the underlying basis of the business? Where, where is the return going to come from that cash? So this is one of those key reasons or key, key things that you have to think about when you're growing your business is, and how long can you sustain this on your own cash, or angel cash, or, or friends and family cash? Right? At what point do you need an influx to get to that next level? Okay. So, big decisions there. All right. The next one is that we, as an organization, we started in Johannesburg in South Africa. You may or may not be able to tell from the accent. Um, and I've been in the UK now for five years, so it hasn't quite rubbed off yet. But I think the the basis of, of starting small and growing is that technology is global. Right? You can build a technology and it is global. It can go anywhere. You can use software in many times over. So we looked at this and said, well, we've got something here. We've developed this core competency underlying software platform. It's applicable everywhere in the world. So let's go global. What does that mean? All right? It means finding a, a way of going from where you are to establishing a beachhead in another region. And you're done in a number of ways. You know, one of the primary ways is to do it by partnership. Go into that region, find a partner, and get them to be your rep. Be, take on your technology and sell it through their channel. You can also go direct. You can send someone out into that region and say, start a business. Find an office, recruit people. Here's your budget. This is what we want you to do. This is what you've got to get on as reference clients. This is the beginning. Right? So you can do it direct as well. And I suppose there's hybrids of those two. We went, the, we went a, 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 I suppose, the direct model. We actually sent out guys, I was 
talk about that now. Right? But technology is global. It's, you can build something here which is applicable everywhere else. If you take too long to go global, someone else is going to look at what you do and say, oh, I can do that locally. And then when you arrive, you've got competition. So there's a, there's a little bit of urgency in terms of taking your idea and actually putting it in another region to obtain that first mover advantage. So yes, you would come to the cliches as we talk. So first mover advantage, you want to get there, you want to be the first guy to do it, because then you can get the, the low-hanging fruit, the guys who are interested in that and who've been looking around for that type of technology. Okay. So I spoke about the pioneers. What we did was we found guys who we thought were going to be the, the entrepreneur, and we sent them from the Johannesburg office around the world. We sent a guy to Sydney, we sent a guy to London, we sent a guy to New York. One guy, called them the pioneers, and how do you know that uh, you're a pioneer? Well, you're the guy with arrows in your back, because it's so hard to be the new guy in the new region and to establish that network and then to actually build the business. All right. But what you do have in that respect is you have control. You have control over the brand, you have control of the, the channel, the process, and you're able to then say, well, this is what I want to do, this is how we should do it. All right. So the pioneers we sent, um, of the three guys, we still have two of them on board, so we made good choices in, in two-thirds of them. One of them didn't really work out. You know, it just happens, might have been the market, might have been the, the chap, but what we have is that we have people who we trusted, knew about us, knew our culture, knew what we wanted to achieve, and then we actually sent them across into the new region and said, start our business over there. And this is how we you want to start off slow, start off small, but this is what you need to do. You need to cover your costs within two years. This is what you should do in terms of budgets, etc. Okay. First impressions count. So one of the things that my guy who went to New York did was he got an office on Wall Street. All right. I thought he was crazy at the time. It wasn't hugely more expensive an office anywhere else in New York. Everything is expensive. But he really liked the address. Okay. So we have an office in Wall Street, and you could not believe how much, or how much value that created in terms of companies when they spoke to us said, oh, I see you've got an office in Wall Street. Wow, you guys must be doing well. That just created a little bit of a, a bubble or an impression of the business being a little bit bigger than it was and helped us get those first couple of clients. So we still have the office on Wall Street, obviously a bit bigger than, than we used to, but uh, it's in, first impressions do count. If you are going to be a business, you've got to be a little bit more professional than just to work from home all right, or, or a home-based business. And that's where it all starts. Everything starts off in, at your desk, you know, in your study, or in your garage, but try and be that little bit professional. You know, get a good URL, get uh, you know, the right amount of, of uh, marketing paraphernalia that you're going to need. When you're going to go and see someone, you need a nice, nicely printed business card. Right? You need someone to answer your telephone that says, Hi, you know, good morning, Striata, or good morning, your brand. Right? Then put you through, even if it's a virtual, you, know, you don't actually have to have a secretary. There's hundreds of services around the world that will be your secretary for you. All right? Have a mail address which is not at your house. Have a mail address in a peer box near your office. All sorts of things that make you appear as if you're a real business, but you can be one or two guys sitting behind your desk. All right. So that was one of those things where I you know, didn't really think of anything of it at the time, but it's worked out to be so Im important. All right. That being said, all our new offices are home offices. All right. We have a totally virtual environment across the world now. Um, we have one main office in Johannesburg where we've got you know, a couple hundred people where we you know, do all the dev and everything else. But all of the rest of the offices around the world work from home even though there is a main office to go to. You can go into the office, you can hot, you know, hot desk at the office, sit down, plug your network cable in, off you go, go to a meeting, come back. But if you don't have a meeting, if you don't actually need to be in the office that day, work from home. All right. It's a different way of working these days. When we employ people, we ask them, have you ever worked from home? And if they haven't, it's a bit of an issue because it takes a little bit of an adjustment. You know, not having people around you all day, not having you know, the ability to bounce something off someone, go to the canteen, have a break, it's a different way of working. But you know, it's incredibly efficient. No commuting, everything is immediately at your fingertips, it's all set up, you know, it's easy to make lunch because you're going to your own fridge. So work from home for us has worked incredibly well. Budgeting. 
I put this up there because as a new business, this is almost like doing puzzles blindfolded. You kind of know what the piece looks like, but you have no idea where it's gonna go. And I'm an accountant, so this stuff for me is normal. You know, this, is, this is stuff I understand. But the one thing I said is that you know, when you put a budget down, be prepared that it could go out by you know, maybe even half. And if you can't afford that, you've got to be really careful because the business will grow and expand and require things at its own pace. And if you're the person who says no, no more, you might be actually stunting that growth that you could achieve if you're just given that little bit extra. Right? So budgets are quite difficult. And it's not, a, it's not a financial function where somebody's sitting in the back office going, here are your numbers. All right. In a growing business, this is about talking about what ifs, could, should we, how are we going to do this, and then saying, what's the opportunity cost of that dollar? So if I give you an extra 10K, what are you going to do with it? If it's an extra 100K, are you going to hire a new person, or are you going to spend that on a marketing campaign, or are you going to go and you're going to give a rebate to these partners so that they can get a bigger piece of the pie so that they will sell more for you going forward? So what is it that you're going to do with that 100K? Because they aren't... There's not an infinite amount of money, okay? There's scarcity of money. It's just a case of what you're going to do with it. So budgeting becomes this trade-off between more people, more marketing, more incentives, more investment in underlying technology. You know, one of my regions may say to me, you know what, I, d I don't want that 100. I want you to develop this. Go and hire a guy in the back end and get him to do this for me because my market really needs that and it's not on the roadmap yet. So take the 100 and do that with it. All right. So budgeting is really an interesting and a, f and a kind of fluid process for us where we look at what we did last year, we look at what we want to achieve, we, we take the salaries of the people because 80% of your costs in any kind of technology business, or, you know, software business especially, ends up being a, um, a ooh, lots of noise. You know, in, so your 80% your, your of your costs end up being people. So when you actually have people, we we want to make sure that the costs associated with those people are taken into account, budgeted for, and then you want three new guys? Okay, well that means you can't have a marketing campaign as well. So the budgeting process and, and where you spend that money and how you invest in each region, so when you're going from a central, from your first home office to a, a, a further region, how do you spend that money? Where do you put it? Right? Is it in the direct model? Is it in the channel? Okay. Reference clients. This is key. So you enter a new market, the first thing you need is a reference client. And you almost give away that first one. The first deal, the first opportunity to get that reference client is do or die. If you don't make any money out of that first client, if you do it just for the, the love, it's fine. Because what you really want is you want to go to the second client and say, this guy's already using it. Because if this guy's using it, you should use it too. And what you find is if you get the second guy in the same industry to also buy in and pay for that use, the third guy is easy. And then the, the, the rest of the industry comes along because they don't want to be left out. So that first one is critical, and don't be afraid to give it away. And when I say give it away, yes, you, you, know, you don't want anything you give away for free has no value. So we don't do deals for free. But when we say give it away, as we do it at such a rock bottom price that the customer always thinks it's too good to be true. And you say to him, we need you as a reference client. And written into the contract is that they will do some marketing with us. They'll be a case study, they'll be a reference, and they'll allow us to talk about them on, you know, in our slideshows, put their brands up on our, our customer deck, etc. So that first one becomes so important. All right? And that might be for your own business, where you're starting in your own region. You need that first customer. You need that first brand that says, I'm using this technology because it's great, does what it's so supposed to, it's innovative, like working with those guys. You know, they, they came in under budget, under time, everything they delivered, superb project management. You want somebody who owes you just a little bit because you gave it to them at a really good price. Okay, so reference clients for any new region is critically important. Obviously, the, the brands that, that we have now, after being in business for many, many years, start becoming you know, globally recognized. Each region, we, put it, we can put together a, a, a logo deck for each region, which is particular to them. I kind of just took our global deck, which has got different companies from all of our different offices around the world. Right. But having something that says, other people buy this stuff, critically important. Okay. 
Right, let's get on to a little bit of a, a tough subject. Patents and IP. If you have an idea, all right, and you think that it's going to change the world, before you use that idea in the public or in the wild, all right, that's not in any kind of, or under any kind of confidentiality clause or paperwork, you have to start the patent then. It's too late to start patenting your idea when you've already spread it around, when you've already pitched it to people, when you've told people about it. All right, so they talk about it being in the wild. When your idea is in the wild, it's not patentable anymore, even if it is innovative, even if you thought about it and it's great. So this is kind of a catch-22, because at the time that you've thought about the idea and that you've put it together and you can draw it up and you can list the steps, you may or may not have the cash that's required to, to go and patent that around the world. And if you patent it in one country, and, now it, and then you start talking about it, and you don't have a patent pending in the other countries, you also miss that boat. So if you wanted to do a global patent for your brand new idea, you're almost looking around the $50,000 mark to do it everywhere, and that's just, you know, that's just legal fees. That's legal and patent fees. It's not actually writing it up and getting it all um, together in the very beginning. So this is kind of a conundrum because you're an entrepreneur, you've got a great idea, you want to actually get it, you want to protect it, but you don't have 50K to go around the world and actually do all of the, the, the different patent applications. All right, so I think there's a big issue with the patent process at this stage, and I'm actually not sure how to do that. We patented our original idea, and because it's now changed so much, it's not really a, you know, what we do now, you know, if you go back to that slide about all of the different um, parts to our, our solution. We only have, we have probably one of those circles in that patent. Right. Why are patents important? Well, I tell you, when you're sitting down and talking to an investor, he wants to know that the th what he's investing in is protected in some way, and patents are a great way to protect it. It actually becomes easier to do new patents as you grow, but then the pat patents are specific to little bits of, of technology. Right. The other side of patents is actually your IP and where that sits, all right? Because where you actually have the IP sitting is where you can bill from or you can license from, and that has implications on your global structure and actually your taxation processes as well. So if you are looking to build a huge business, one of the things that happens when you've got a big business is that you have a tax bill. And if you want to actually keep that to a manageable level or to minimize that as much as you can, what you need is you need to be able to show that the IP is held in a particular place that is tax friendly and that then you can build through that. And I'm sure you've read about Google, about um, all the guys that are, are setting up these different structures and how they move the cash through them. All right? Why do they do that? Because it's big money. All right. when you, if you're going to build a business that's going to have a lot of cash coming through it, if that's your aim and that's what we all want to do, you need to think about this on day one so that you can get your IP sitting in the right place. All right. If you have your IP sitting in a jurisdiction that's not really tax friendly, it starts costing you a lot of money to move it. Right. The next thing about this is that as soon as you become a certain size, you become a target for patent trolls. Now, this is interesting in its own way, and, and it's quite pertinent to us. We've just been served our very first cease and desist letter from somebody who says they have a patent over technology that we're using. And we look back at what we did and how we developed it, and we're like, well, we didn't even know you existed. But you've written down a couple things that say, if there is a system that may have a customer that has a, a server, and then there's an email that goes from the server to the customer, we've patented that. And you kind of look at it and go, but hang on a moment, that's just email. You can't patent email, all right? And you say, well, no, yes, we can, because anything that is slightly different to the next thing you know, could be potentially patented. So what, what we have in the, the world these days is also things called patent trolls, guys who have just taken those kind of patents, bought them up, and then they send you a letter. And the problem with this is that if you end up going to court on it, it'll cost you more than just settling with them, all right? Called patent trolls. Hopefully, you get to the size of a business that you actually have these problems. And we, we said to ourselves that at the point that we actually get a letter, we know that we've got to a certain size because we're being targeted by these guys. All right. It's interesting. We spoke to our lawyers. They said, oh, we've looked at it. Don't worry. They'll send them a letter. There'll be lots of letters going forwards and backwards and forwards. There's very little chance this will ever get to court. All right. um, the problem with going to court is that you've got to put aside almost a quarter of a million dollars to go to court on a patent issue. 
Right? Lots of money when you actually didn't think that you even did anything wrong to start. So two sides to the intellectual property patenting process. The positive side, if you do have an idea and it is unique and it's going to be the, the core of your business and you want to show that you've protected it, you need to think of patents early on. But patents cost money, so you've got to think of how you're going to fund that. In terms of your IP, where is it going to sit? Which jurisdiction is going to sit and how can we then make sure that you have a, an, a path to royalties and also to, from a taxation perspective, how you can, you can get the best out of that IP. Your business and your IP don't have to be in the same place. All right. Out of interest, our IP sits in the Dutch company, our business sits in the US, in South Africa, and the UK. So it's interesting that the IP is totally separate, but the money can move through an IP company into a tax-friendly jurisdiction. Right. Next thing I thought I'd talk about is the advisory board. And I'm sure that you've all heard about this. You know, you've, you start a business, and the first thing you've got to do is you've got to go and get all sorts of seriously gray-haired, brainy, and successful people to sit on your advisory board. I'm sure that at some point that advisory board looked very, very impressive. Okay? To all of us here, probably not the right profile of people that you'd want on your advisory board. But if you go and actually spend time reading up on advisory boards, they can be incredibly valuable to any small startup. Because what they do is they give you both introductions as well as opportunities. So you have operational advisory boards, guys who will actually muck in and go, look, let me help you with your tech. Let me tell you how to do this. I want to structure the business like this. You know, let's talk about where your IP is going to sit. You know, really guys who get hands on. And then you've got network advisory boards. Somebody who go, listen, I need to speak to somebody at Microsoft. Who do you know? And they'll wheel you into somebody that they know, warm introduction, and you can sit in front of somebody and talk about what the opportunities are for your technology within that business of a very warm introduction. You can't, you can't actually understand how valuable that can be in the bigger picture of things. And you can only get that through somebody who's interested in your business. So an advisory board has got seriously good value if that's, if that's for your path for your business. On our advisory board, we have different guys from in different regions. We have guys in America, we have guys in, in Europe. We obviously have some guys in South Africa where we started as well. Right. We look to them when we're going to make a big decision. We say, look, we're thinking of spending a serious amount of money doing this. What do you think? Where do you, you know, who can I go and sit with and talk to about this to see if it's a good idea or not? They'll come up with a lunch or a dinner. For the cost of a lunch or a dinner, you sit in front of somebody who's incredibly experienced, knowledgeable about that thing, and that's the value of an advisory board. They just make that connection. Okay. So one of the, the pieces of information that one of our directors gave us in the very beginning, a non-executive director, is when we were talking about how do, you, how do you build a business for future value? And he said, build it and they'll come. And he wasn't talking about the technology. It's, and this is not just go and build a fancy piece of technology and it'll all work out. This is about build a good business. And then the people who are interested in buying into that business or taking a, a, a stake or, or investing, they will come to you. If you build a business to sell it, it's much harder. If you build a business to flip it, much harder. If you build a business that you don't mind when you're actually going to exit or how you're going to get the, the final value for what you've been building for many years, if you just build it to keep doing business every year growing, right, then people come to you. And I can tell you from our perspective, this is 100% true. We get approaches from VCs on a weekly basis. All right? We keep in touch with probably 10 or so different VCs, constantly having a half an hour chat every now and again. We have an investor briefing where we send out. These are not guys that are invested in our business at all. These are guys who may invest in our business in the future. So what do you want to do? You want to maintain that relationship. You want to keep them up to date with where you're going, your vision, and how you're actually achieving that and being successful. Right? You want to keep them sweet. So if you carry on doing a good business, all right, then those people will end up coming to you and wanting to be involved and wanting to invest. And that's a much better place to be than two months running out of cash and not knowing what's going to happen. All right. And it goes back to that original kind of VC bootstrap or jockstrap. When you're in a, a treadmill situation of burn on a monthly basis and you've got n number of months worth of cash in the bank, then you've got to get refunded. 
that is a seriously stressful place to be. All right. It also is incredibly exciting because if you are growing at that rate, you will get that next influx. It will grow your business bigger. They'll put a whole chunk of cash in. You'll be able to go to the next step. So I'm not saying that VCs don't have their place. I, th I think the, the VC market is a, a, a core part of how technology companies grow and get bigger. But you've got to be really careful about getting on that treadmill and then actually getting to the point where you run out. Because at that point, your owner's equity, the, you know, the guys who sweated and started in the garage and, and bootstrapped this business, they find that they just get wiped out. All right. So what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you have the next round way before you need it. And if you, to do that, you build a good business and then it'll come. All right. The key message in terms of all of this is that don't build it just to flip it. Build a business with all the elements that go into a good business. You know, think about the cash flow. Think about the, the, the structure of the business. Think about the people. And in putting that all together as a, as a whole, and it's a good business, then people will end up coming to you. So you know, we started in a garage. We're now you know, about 150 people all over the world. We have customers in 14 different countries, five continents. We have, uh, I think we recently did our, our two billionth document that was delivered. So we're a, a sizable business. And the idea behind it all is that software, you can repeat it many times over. New server, load the software, next, uh, next service up and running. It's not one where it's got a, a, a human element that has to keep cranking the handle, um, which is what we originally were thinking about and envisaging. All right. So I figured that the most important part of this talk was actually going to be the time where I'd get some questions from the audience about how did you do this, what was important there, and if, if I'm in this situation, what would you advise? So we have our angel with the, the microphone, and uh, we have a first, first question in the front and then the back. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming, first of all. Pleasure. Uh, you started your story from where you were already in the garage delivering. Can you take a step back and, s and tell the story of how you actually understood that the idea was the right one and you brought together the first team? Sure. So I'm an accountant. Um, I work for PwC. And in typical fashion, when you're an accountant, you have to do a period of articles and auditing. And man, I hated auditing. It was terrible. It was boring. You have to go and look at pieces of paper and make them match up. And you have to go, it's 100 there, it's 100 there, tick. It's 50 there, it's 50 there, tick. And I realized I didn't want to do that. So I quickly got into the technology side. And in PwC, the internet was just started. And they needed somebody to build a website. So I just put up my hand and said, I'll do it. I didn't even know what a website was. I just didn't want to do auditing anymore. So I started out in that regard. And I, I moved as the internet grew. And this was in, in South Africa in 93, 94, and the, you know, the beginning of, of how things were getting up to speed. And I just got more and more involved in the internet. And the, at the point when I left Coopers, I was running the internet part or division of their business. Um, and it was pure by luck that I just said, yes, I'll do it. All right. So accountant by training, technology by interest, and I was headhunted to, to go into a business that was the biggest internet development business in the country. They developed like Deloitte, South African Airways, Anglo Platinum. They developed the biggest websites. Uh, and it was at a point where the, the graphics were the most important part of a website. Okay, the Content management systems weren't even thought of. You know, everything was hard coded. It was a page with a link and a page with a link. And everything was built in Notepad. You know, I think the biggest thing that had happened in that business was Dreamweaver. Okay. Um, I was into the new business in four months, and Microsoft came out with front page, and the cost of a web page went from 400 to 20 bucks. All right, so we had to reinvent ourselves, and we went e commerce. And what happened with that is that we had massive projects. 100 people all working on delivering this enormous e-commerce engine, and then at the end of the project, nothing. So then I had to you know, kind of figure out, what are you going to do? How do you, how do you just work out this project-based business where you've got big project, nothing, big project, nothing, feast or famine? And I realized I didn't want to be in that business at all. It was horrible because you've worked, you've worked nights, you've worked days, you've, you've burnt the midnight oil with people, and at the end of the project, you lay them off. That's horrible. All right. You can't ever get a project-based business at that size when everyone's working on one project to have timing right where the next client signs as you finish the first project. 
So what you really need is scale. You need 100 people, but you need, each, you need to break it into five teams, and you have each team working on a different project, different start dates, different end dates that you can roll over. Very difficult. So I realized I didn't want to be in projects. I wanted to be in internet, and the web and e-commerce side became seriously congested, and I thought I wanted to be in something where there's a highway, there's an infrastructure, and I can just ride on the infrastructure. Email. Email was something that nobody had focused on, and email marketing was just starting out, so we went into email marketing in a big way, and the email corporation was, was born. Um, and what I did was, I, in the very beginning, is I went to the most well-known person on the internet in South Africa at the time. His name is Arthur Goldstuck. You can look him up. He wrote a book in South Africa called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Internet. It was hugely popular, and it, it kind of had version 1.0, this is ARPA, you know, in the very beginning. Um, it was an interesting book, but he was, he was sending out a newsletter manually using BCCs. And we took over that newsletter and we distributed his news newsletter for him using our platform that we had just you know, acquired. And so we started out and we said, look, we'll do it for free. As long as you put it at the bottom of there, sent by the email corporation. And we used his brand to then grow into it and go to the next guy and say, we'll do this for you, but it'll cost a little bit. And then we'll do this for you and it'll cost more. And at the point when the banks in South Africa wanted to send out messages to their internet banking base, they needed someone to do it, and we were the biggest in the market, and then they came to us. Probably the only one in the market at that stage. So the business evolved from not wanting to be in e-commerce websites to choosing a different process, which was email, and then finding somebody who needed that and using their brand to hook our, our business to. Yeah? Super. In the front, yes. Is it working? Oh, working. Okay. There we go. Hi. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, one thing I'm always intrigued about, a lot of people talk about KPIs, what you should be looking for, where to invest the money, and how to follow how the money is spent. What would you recommend for a starting business? You know, what is the key thing to follow on the KPIs? You know, customer acquisition costs, lifetime value of the customer, all, all these things. What is in, in your experience? I mean, it's the easiest answer. It's just cash flow. It's cash flow in your business. So I measure our entire business on one graph each week. Each week I get a graph from our CFO that shows me the cash in the bank. And, and I measure the business on that because that is the ultimate, the ultimate sh ex you know, example or the, the ultimate um, indicator of how we're doing. If there's more cash in the bank at the end of the week, we're doing well. Right? If there's not, well, I want to go and look at other things to see why. Let me see our debtors. Are we not collecting the cash? Let me see our sales. Are we not actually selling? Let me see our dev. Are we not actually producing something that people want to buy that will make a debtor that will... You know, so it, it goes, so it's a very simple version for me. In a startup, I'd say cash is important because you've got a burn rate. You know, you, you're not yet making money, you're not yet profitable. All right, so your burn rate is important because how much money have you got in the bank and how long before that runs out and what is the chance of taking that hockey stick to say, we're either going to get another investment or we're going to get a client who's going to pay us and then we're going to use that money to, to, to carry on. So the key message in terms of startups is burn rate, is cash flow. Got to look at the cash. Um, you can do all sorts of deals that don't have cash. You can do partnerships. You can do, I'll do this for free if you do that for free. You know, that's great in, in terms of building the business. But you've got to make sure that you, you look after the cash because too many great ideas just fall off the cliff because your business ran out of cash. Okay. And that's, you know, that's bootstrap and jockstrap again you know, because at the point where you're running out of cash, you go to that VC and now they go, great, but I'll have 80% of your business, thank you. And suddenly from owning 100% of an idea, you've got a VC who's going to fund you for a little bit and you only own 20% of your business again. So for us, it was so important for the original founders to be able to invest ourselves. And all of the people that are still investors in our business took second mortgages on their homes to actually fund the business at some point. But we all believed that there was a better place to invest our money than anywhere else. Okay, and it's a cheap loan. The bank gives it to you on your house. You know, you don't have to, you're not going for a, an expensive loan. It's not Wonga. Okay, super. Um, I'm just about to start opening my own business. Um, 
trying to develop a piece of technology. I'm hoping so. Yay, hoping. entrepreneurs. How, how do you start? Um, I, I'm looking at a physical piece of technology. I'm a, a massive, massive uh, initial investment. And obviously at the moment, I don't have any physical uh, piece of technology to show to investors to get them to want to invest in the first place. How do you... Okay, so this is a piece of tech that... It's, it's a piece of technology to manufacture aircraft and spacecraft carbon fiber with parts. So okay. how do you go about getting something that large um, from just an idea to something that's physically... Startups, there's a whole, th there's a whole funding chain and one of the, the initial points or nodes on the funding chain is an angel investor. And it sounds like your first point of call is going to be an angel investor. It's somebody who, who likes taking a punt on new technology, likes you, likes your idea, and can also put you in touch with somebody who may be your first partner, your first manufacturer, you may be your first client. So they'll look at your idea and say, I can add value. I'll put some money in, I'll keep you afloat, I'll get you the, the opportunity to actually start, but I'll also make sure that you've got the outlet for what you're trying to do. So I'll give you a person to talk to, or a partnership, or I'll just do a handshake and a warm introduction to somebody who knows somebody in that space. So as a startup, you're probably looking for an angel. We had an angel in our first business. I, I spoke about the garage. At a point that we couldn't work in the garage because it was so hot in the African sun, um, we needed to actually go and find an office. I you know, spoke to a friend who spoke to a friend. You know, eventually, we, we got to speak to a, um, a business, and they said, we like this idea. Here, have some money. Don't waste it. Okay, it was an angel investment. It was from a business, but it was really a person who believed in us and used his business to invest in us. All right. Um, we went through an MBO later on, and as I was explaining when, we, when I started, we went through that potential round of the of VC. At the point that it all fell over and it was horrible, we actually did an MBO. Everybody mortgaged their house. We got a, a, a kind of an investment trust to give us some money as well to take over from the VC, and we bought them out. All right, but we, we still have that, that kind of angel factor where an original investor owns a, a piece of equity because they were there when we needed them most. So as a startup, your first point of call is not VC money. They want to see a business. They want to see people. They want to see a management team. They want to see that you've actually got something. You need an angel. Okay. There's lots of angel networks in the UK. All right, so if you just go and do a, a search on angel networks, you'd, you'll be able to actually, there's a forum. And I'm sure you've seen Dragon's Den. Think of that outside the limelight of the cameras. All right, maybe one guy across an office, make an appointment, tell him what you're doing. All right, if he can help you, he will. If he likes the idea and he thinks it's got wings, mm -hmm. then you'll fly. Okay. Who's next? How are we doing for time? All right, we've got about five minutes before we have to dash. Okay. If there's no more questions, then there's, there's a, a couple other things I can just tell you about the business. Um, we give out long service awards. All right. we, you know, we're 14 years old. Um, we've got people in our business that have been with us for 13, 12, 10, 11, 10 years. All right. A sign of a business that's got a really good opportunity is that people stick around. All right. But then choosing those people is incredibly important. I've, I've had the same partner in my business. So I'm the accountant side, I do the business side. I've, had a, I've got a technology partner. He does the technology side. I've had the same guy for 13 years. I worked with him at VWV, which was the e-commerce e company that I ran. He was the techie. Um, and when I left there, I said to him, come and join me. Um, and of course, having restraints of trades and things, he couldn't do that straight away. So we left it for exactly one year and a day, and then he joined me. All right, and we started that business. I had started the business, but then he came on as my, my primary partner. It's hard going it alone. You know, having partners, having somebody who's got a separate set of skills to you and you can do a part of the business that you can't, that's incredibly important too. All right, and then along the way, we've, we've picked up other good people and they're stuck around. All right, so my management team, most of them have been with me for more than 10 years. All right, and th that kind of loyalty and that kind of trust Man, it's hard to replicate anywhere. And it's something that somebody said to me, well, you know, what are you going to do after Striata? Well, you know, you're going to sell this business to somebody that's going to be fantastic and everything. And what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, because I, I, I love working with these people so much. I don't know if I'd ever want to leave. You know, I might just carry on doing what I'm doing. Somebody else may own a piece of the equity. 
but the people that I work with, I have so much fun and I enjoy and I can trust and I, I know they're, they're looking after me and, and I've got their back and they've got mine. People are incredibly important. So when you are doing your startup, make sure you choose your partners incredibly carefully. You, it's like a marriage, but it's almost as important, or maybe not even more so. You know, you're, you're in this together for a long time. And then like a marriage, you better have a good shareholders agreement that spells out what happens if you're not happy. All right? um, we, I have one, or I had one partner who was involved, and he wasn't happy. And the split, the breakup, was painful. You know, lots of angst, lots of, but I, this is what I expected, and I'm not getting it, and, and this is what I thought would happen, and it's not happening, and you guys are doing this, and a lot of angst. You know, obviously, that's part of, of life, and it's part of any type of business, but if you choose your partners carefully and then document how both the relationship's going to work and what happens if you split up, that'll stand you in good stead later on. You know, all contracts are like that. You write a contract, you put it in the drawer, and you hope that you never pull it out again. But at the point that you pull it out, it's unbelievably important about what's in there. So spend a little bit of time up front making sure that it's got everything that you think is important to you written down in some way. And I know this is another catch-22. It's kind of chicken and the egg. How do you spend money on contracts, on paperwork, and, and making sure you've got all of that at a point in the very beginning of a business that you have no money? Now, you're talking about starting a... a a technology business which is going to have potentially a huge amount of investment, you need to make sure that your contracts with A, your, your d delivery partners or your manufacturing partners, etc., all of that kind of stuff, those are going to have to be iron tight. How do you do that if you don't have money to pay a lawyer to put them together? You can't do that yourselves. All right, so this is where the angel investment would come in. They put the money in to allow you to do that. I need 50 grand for patents. Okay, I like your idea. I'll put the 50 grand in for patents. I know where it's going to. I know what you're going to spend it on. Um, that's a reasonable spend. All right, I need another 50K to put together shield agreements and everything else. Fine, I also want that, so I'll put that money in as well. You know, all of this kind of process of what am I going to use the money for that you're giving me all right, becomes important. All right, then I need, I need a salary because I'm doing this, yes, but I've got to live and I've got to be able to put um, bread on the table at home. I've got to be able to eat, but I'm going to take a very small salary because actually my value is sweat equity into the business. All right, so then the, and the angel investor looks at that and says, I like the fact that you're taking a really small salary that you're investing. I'm okay. I'll pay your salary for a year. But at that point, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z, or we've got to find someone else to put the next set of money in. Right. This is just, you know, this is kind of startup you know, 101 stuff. Um, there's a great book if you want to go and read it called The Lean, Start or the Lean Startup um, by Rice. I forget his surname at the moment. Um, but if you go and look at The Lean Startup, it, it talks about how to do this and not just throw money against the wall. You know, how to start small, how to, how to keep your cash, how to make sure that, you, that you've got more money in the bank than you need at every point in time. Because the last thing you want to do as a small business is get to being two months out and you, can't, you, you don't know what's going to happen after that. Um, interesting, now that we're in the position that we're in, I get guys coming and sitting across the desk for me saying, you know, this is my business, everything else, I'm running out of money in two months. What can I do? You know, can, you, can you help us out? Can you do this or, or how would this work? So I know this is a reality for everybody when they're out there and they're starting their business is that putting the cash into it, that's going to allow you to grow to the point that you're then self-sustaining in some way or the next influx of capital is easy and you've got lots of people competing for it rather than one guy who's got you by the short and curlies. That becomes really important. All right, so... As I said, we manage our business now on a weekly graph, Friday graph, where's the cash? You know, all the different bank accounts in the world, all added up, the number's there. All right? And if it's going up, we know we're doing well. And that's from an accountant. So yes, I know all about the underlying figures and, and KPIs and budgeting and, and tracking according to the budgets. But actually, at the end of the day, how much money is in the bank? That's how you measure your business. All right. Any other questions? No? I'm exactly one minute out, so I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being up this morning or not going to sleep at all. I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>